Welcome back everyone, this is my new Thor Love and Thunder video. Marvel just released a new first look at Rune King Thor in some of the other major characters costumes, including Christian Bale's Gore the God Butcher costume, Valkyrie in Lady Thor's full armor, and what the reforged Mjolnir hammer is going to look like. So if you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the videos. I know everybody's been asking, when are they going to finally do Rune King Thor in the MCU? Most powerful version of Thor ever. He's almost too powerful to use in a story, so I'll try to explain how I think they're adapting his storyline just based on what they're pitching us in this new promo. The other funny thing about Thor Love and Thunder is that it's actually the first big Marvel Phase 4 movie that isn't directly influenced or tied to the events of Spider-Man No Way Home. There is a little bit of timeline overlap that I'll explain, but like it's hard to talk about Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness without talking about what happened in Spider-Man No Way Home. But all the stuff that's going on with Gore the God Butcher, the Guardians of the Galaxy, the As Guardians of the Galaxy, doesn't really have anything to do with Doctor Strange's spells, either the first one or the second one, or any of the multiverse characters from No Way Home. So no worries if you have not seen Spider-Man No Way Home yet. I know there's still a couple of countries that for some strange reason have not got the movie yet. There was a minor Thor Love and Thunder Easter egg in Spider-Man No Way Home, but it's just like a really quick blink and you'll miss it Easter egg. It's a Daily Bugle scene just referencing political turmoil in New Asgard, which is all about Valkyrie becoming their new ruler after Avengers Endgame and how, practically speaking, not everybody in New Asgard and the Nine Realms is happy with the changes, quote unquote, that she's making. Remember that scene at the end of Avengers Endgame where she said her whole deal for accepting Thor's offer was that she would be making changes. You know, I'd make a lot of changes around here. <laughs> I'm counting on it, your majesty. So that's probably why there's political turmoil during the events of Spider-Man No Way Home. And if it wasn't clear, the events of Spider-Man No Way Home are supposed to take place before Thor Love and Thunder. Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness might be happening around the same time Thor and Gore the God Butcher start throwing down. Usually there's a little bit of overlap between all the Marvel movies. But Gore, Jane Foster, Lady Thor, they aren't meant to be multiverse characters, even though Spider-Man No Way Home, Doctor Strange, Multiverse of Madness are very much multiverse movies. Thor Love and Thunder is going to get more into the mythology of the gods of the MCU. But what it seems like they're doing with Rune King Thor, just based on his costume here, I'm calling him Rune King Thor because clearly his costume is inspired by Rune King Thor's costume with the mixture of the blues and the gold is that during the movie, they're just going to make Thor the most powerful that he's ever been. And that's basically who Rune King Thor was supposed to be, if you haven't read that run in the comics. It's a fairly self-contained story, so I will explain what happened during the comic book version and how I think they're going to change some of that for the movies. In that story, Thor goes through Ragnarok, like they did in the MCU, and almost all of his family, all of his allies and friends die, and he decides that he must seek the wisdom of Odin so that he can understand how to become a true god. He decides to truly embrace his potential as a god, which was the whole deal at the end of Ragnarok. Are you the god of hammers? Like, basically, Odin was trying to explain to him that you never needed the hammer. You already had all this power within you the whole time. But in the MCU, he went through that whole arc during Avengers Infinity War and Avengers Endgame and was kind of laid low. So at the end of Avengers Endgame, he goes with the Guardians of the Galaxy, the As Guardians of the Galaxy, on a journey of self-discovery, kind of like Rune King Thor went on to attain true wisdom. So Thor is trying to gain the Odin Force, and the Odin Force is basically the combined life energy of Odin and his two brothers. It was created when the three of them fought Surtur for the first time. Odin's brothers died, but Odin absorbed their life energy, creating the Odin Force, and that gave him the power-up to defeat Surtur for the first time. They actually referenced that at the beginning of the Thor Ragnarok movie, when Thor is joking with Surtur, didn't my father kill you like a million years ago? That was basically the event that created the Odin Force. Surtur. Son of a bitch, you're still alive. I thought my father killed you like a half a million years ago. So after Ragnarok, Odin is dead. Thor does not have the Odin Force. The Odin Force just kind of becomes this disembodied power just floating around the universe. And it visits Thor and explains to him how he can attain the power that Odin had. But in order to do that, he has to follow a similar path. But the Odin Force tells Thor, do you just want what Odin had or do you want more? Do you want to take this further? Do you want to gain the full potential of the power that you can wield? So in order to do that, he has to sacrifice way more than Odin ever sacrificed. And this plays on a lot of Norse mythology tropes. He learns that Odin sacrificed one of his eyes to the well of Mimir to gain cosmic knowledge. So Thor sacrifices both of his eyes and essentially becomes omniscient. He gains so much cosmic power that he can see through time. He can see all timelines and then gains the full power of the runes. And that's why he's called Rune King Thor. 
The runes are basically this Asgardian cosmic artifact that give the wielder knowledge that he wouldn't normally be able to obtain. And the more you go through, the more you sacrifice, the greater access to the runes you have. And the whole idea is that Odin was only wielding the runes at about half of their potential. But Thorin sacrificing twice as much as Odin gains twice the power, gains full access to the runes. So essentially he goes from being a little G-god to a capital G-god. Like celestial level character, omniscient, omnipotent, pretty much unkillable for anyone except for the highest order of cosmic characters like the Beyonder or the One Above All, the Living Tribunal, you get the idea. In the comics, Odin was able to hand Galactus his ass, so if Rune King Thor is twice as powerful as Odin was, he becomes so powerful he's like a cosmic entity in his own right now. But because that's too powerful to use in like normal Marvel stories, like it's just way too OP, in order to bring him back down to normal levels, they said that this ultimate god tier Thor basically went into this cosmic sleep state, kind of becoming one with the universe, and eventually a version of Odin was reborn, reclaimed the Odin force for himself, and then a version of Thor returned to Earth, the Nine Realms, vastly depowered. So heading into Marvel Phase 4 and beyond, Chris Hemsworth said that he did want to keep coming back for more Marvel movies as the Thor character after Thor Love and Thunder, so I don't think they're going to do the exact Rune King Thor storyline for him. Like, he'll just become more of a god in the true sense of the word, and embrace more of a grander cosmic role. Like, he'll start spending more time helping the entire universe, not just Asgard and Earth. Cosmic level threats, responsibilities, and it'll be a way of explaining why he's not around for every single event. Like, oh, Thor is dealing with cosmic level problems. He doesn't have time to deal with these small Earth level problems. And that'll be a way of explaining how Valkyrie can still continue ruling over Asgard because Thor is dealing with even bigger cosmic threats. Valkyrie's new costume looks more like a combination of her white Valkyrie armor and Thor's armor without the sleeves. Like, everyone in this movie is going guns out, full on. Everyone wants you to buy two tickets to the gun show, even Natalie Portman. The metal pattern at the bottom that looks kind of like the Asgardian version of Chainmail also seems like it's based on the new comic book Valkyrie's costume, who is also Jane Foster. That's right, Jane Foster is like the newest Valkyrie. She becomes Valkyrie after she stops being Lady Thor and wielding Mjolnir. Jane Foster's Lady Thor costume looks kind of like a combination of comic book Lady Thor and Thor's old MCU costumes, with a little added red material just to give it some color and make it pop a little more on screen. The other really important thing here is Mjolnir. This confirms my theory from earlier this year. The version of Thor's hammer that she wields is just the original hammer that reforms itself through its magic or Odin's enchantment. Notice all the cracks that are laced with magical energy pouring out? That's the same energy you saw when Hela destroyed the hammer. In the movie, it seems like the Asgardians create two special shrines here. This large shrine is just the site where Odin died on the cliffside, so it's meant to be a memorial to him. And they created another smaller one here at the site where Mjolnir was destroyed. Like, they didn't move the pieces of the broken hammer. They just placed them on this pedestal here. So what they're implying here in this scene is that something happens in Asgard, maybe Gore the God Butcher shows up and starts killing a whole bunch of people, and Jane Foster is standing near Odin's memorial in the pieces of Mjolnir, and maybe she touches one of the broken pieces, and the magic of the hammer or Odin's original enchantment just deems her worthy, she fulfills the qualifications, and that automatically causes the hammer to reform itself, gives her her powers and her armor. The original enchantment just read, whosoever holds this hammer, if they be worthy, shall possess the power of Thor. So that's a broad enough magical enchantment that as long as Natalie Portman's Jane Foster touches one of the pieces in, in whatever the circumstances are, whatever's going on around this, it deems her worthy and that reactivates it. Like I said though, she's also guns out and she has the blonde hair from comic book Lady Thor. The reason why they did that in the comics though, the reason why the enchantment changed her hair color mostly was a way to hide her identity because it was meant to be this big mystery when she was first introduced, like who is this person? But since we already know that it's Jane Foster in the MCU, in the movie, they might not be doing the whole secret identity thing. As for Gore the God Butcher's costume, this is just what he looks like on set. Obviously, this is meant to be a little bit of mocap, so they'll tune this way, way up in post-production with special effects. You can kind of see how they're trying to make him look kind of like comic book Gore with the Necro Sword, with the way it kind of billows around him, like the sword itself gives him this black cloak. I know there are a lot of Venom questions, too, because of all the recent Venom multiverse crossover. But I don't think they're going to say that the Necro Sword in this movie or the power that Gore wields is the primal symbiote. If they want to do that, I think later on they'll just kind of retcon it in quietly the way they do that every once in a while in the MCU. 
But everybody, let me know in the comments, what do you think about Rune King Thor's costume in the movie? I know everybody's just excited to see the most powerful version of Thor that you've ever seen in the MCU. They'll probably release the first Thor Love and Thunder trailer when Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness hits theaters in a couple months, so we should see some more footage from the movie pretty soon. Click here for my brand new Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness video, and click here for my Spider-Man No Way Home alternate ending video and deleted scenes. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe, and I'll see you guys in the next one.